Hello, and welcome to Films Across Borders, Stories of Resilience and Hope. I'm Nada Maluf, Chief Advancement Officer in the School of Communication at American University. Through our work at the School of Communication and presentations such as this, we seek to serve the nation and the world as a teaching, training, and research leader in the field of communication studies, film and media arts, journalism, and public communication. This is our sixth year working in partnership with embassy cultural organizations, arts institutions, and environmental groups showcasing films about the major issues of our time. Our focus this year is on the very timely theme of resilience and hope. Now, more than ever, we need stories to inspire and lift us. Thank you to all of our partners for their collaboration this year. Please visit our website at filmsacrossborders.org for details on the entire series. I am pleased to share the Films Across Borders film series trailer now. On behalf of our partners, we extend a personal invitation to join us at any of these film events open to the public virtually this fall. to extend our special gratitude to our co-hosts for this evening's event, AU Center for Environmental Filmmaking and AU's Entertainment and Media Alumni Alliance, without whose participation this would not be possible. AU is committed to offering first-class environmental film programs worldwide, primarily through the Center for Environmental Filmmaking and programs such as this one. We believe immersive and interactive storytelling to be powerful catalysts that inform, inspire, and empower. This evening, we are excited to host a live panel discussion on the award-winning documentary, The Serengeti Rules. The film explores the discoveries of five pioneering scientists, Tony Sinclair, Mary E. Power, Bob Payne, John Turborg, and Jim Estes, whose decades of research laid the groundwork for modern ecology and offer hope that environmentalists today may be able to upgrade damaged ecosystems by understanding the rules that govern them. Immersed in some of the most remote and spectacular places on earth, from the majestic Serengeti to the Amazon jungle, from the Arctic Ocean to the Pacific tide pools, they discovered a single set of rules that govern all life. The film most recently won an Emmy Award for Outstanding Nature Documentary during the 41st Annual News and Documentary Awards. The New York Times selected it as a critic's pick and the LA Times said it had stunning nature cinematography that offered a hopeful message. It has also received the prestigious Grand Ecran Big Screen Award at the Paris Science International Science Film Festival, won top awards at the Jackson Film Wild Film Festival, won a Wild Screen Pan Award for Best Theatrical and took home the Van Lewick Conservation Award at the Rotterdam Wildlife Film Festival. Before I introduce our distinguished moderator, let's take a look at the trailer for this important film. There's a sign when you get off the airplane there not the end of the world, but you can see it from here. They said, can a bird man study buffalo? I said, of course, I'll study anything. I knew nothing about the ocean, and he said, you'd be perfect for this. I just had to be underwater for the rest of my life. 
this remarkable band of scientists went out into the world and just followed their passion and their curiosity. I've always said that science is detective work. But at the time we started, nobody knew anything at all. Instead of one spider monkey in 10 years, I could see 10 spider monkeys in 10 minutes. The wildebeest in their huge numbers were determining everything inside the park. I was stunned. I had never seen anything like this before. Whether it was terrestrial or aquatic, whether it was arctic or tropical, it was all working in the same way. We found the rules, how systems work, how the world works. This was a major deal. The clear message is that some animals are more important than others. If you lose the wrong ones, if you lose the keystones, you're going to see very big changes. What does this mean for you and me? It means we can use this knowledge to upgrade the places around us. Nature can heal itself. Welcome back. I am pleased to introduce our moderator for this evening, Maggie Burnett Stogner, the Executive Director of the Center for Environmental Filmmaking and a favorite professor of film and media arts here in the School of Communication. She brings over 30 years of filmmaking experience to the fore, including nine years at National Geographic, where she produced, directed, and wrote numerous documentaries. In 2005, she launched Blue Bear Films, to create timely and topical documentaries, including this year's Unbreathable, The Fight for Healthy Air, and The Executioner's Shadow in 2018, and Gold Mountain in 2016. Maggie, over to you. Thank you, Nada, so very much. And I really want to say a warm welcome to everybody. I'm um, just honored to have this panel tonight and what an extraordinary film. Um, I also want to do a, a shout out to my students from the Producing Environmental and Wildlife Filmmaking class who are joining us today. And I notice that we have people from as far away as Australia, Canada, hello to my cousins in Canada, and, uh, and the UK. So um, please, a warm welcome. And I'm going to introduce um, our panelists. I'm, I could not be more honored to have such a distinguished group um, with us this evening. Um, Sean Carroll the author of The Serengeti Rules, upon which the film is based and who has a key role in the film. He's an award-winning scientist, writer, educator, and film producer. He's a vice president for science education at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, the Balo Simon Chair of Biology at the University of Maryland, and is a member of the National Academy of Sciences. Sean has received the Benjamin Franklin Medal in Life Scientists, been a finalist for the National Book Award in Nonfiction, and earned one Emmy and two Emmy nominations for documentary films. And his most recent book is a series of fortunate events, Chance and the Making of the Planet, Life and You, published just this October by Princeton University Press. Please welcome Sean Carroll. I, I wish we were doing this live. This virtual space is uh, a little constraining. <laughs> um, please welcome Dr. Kiho Kim. He's a professor of environmental sciences at American University. Dr. Kim is a marine ecologist specializing in tropical coral reefs. His research focuses on understanding the role of diseases in marine ecosystems and the synergistic, synergistic effects of environmental factors, such as nutrient pollution and climate change in the degradation of coral reefs. Most recently, he has been using biogeochemical approaches to understand nitrogen dynamics and their interaction with disease within individual corals to entire coastal communities and coastal ecosystems. He is also executive director, we're very lucky to have him, executive director of the American University's Center for Teaching, Research, and Learning. 
Thank you. Please welcome Kiho Kim. And last but certainly not least is Fred Tutman, who I had the pleasure of meeting um, when we did a special workshop on developing films a year and a half ago with the um, Environmental Film Festival of the nation's capital. Uh, he is a grassroots community advocate for clean water in Maryland's long and deepest interstate waterway and holds the title of Patuxent River Keeper, a title that in a future life I want to have. <laughs> I love that, which is also the name of a nonprofit organization that he founded in 2004. He lives and works on an active farm located near the Patuxent River that has been in his, family, his family's ancestral home for nearly a century. Prior to riverkeeping, Fred spent over 25 years working as a media producer and consultant on telecommunication assignments on four continents, including a stint covering the Falkland War in Argentina for the BBC. He's managing of, he has managed a Ford Foundation funded project to help African traditional healers tell their stories to the world and nine years of intensive media productions for the fire and emergency management organizations. He's won several awards for TV and radio production and writing. Uh, in recent years, he's taught courses in environmental law and policy at St. Mary's College of Maryland and served as a graduate studies advisor at Goddard College in Vermont. He splits his time between Maryland and North Carolina where he maintains a busy blacksmith forge. He's a recipient of numerous regional and state awards for his various environmental works and is the longest serving waterkeeper in the Chesapeake Bay region and the only African-American waterkeeper in the nation and the proud new father of a five month old golden lab. <laughs> Welcome everybody. I'm really delighted to have you here. Um, I will be asking some questions, but there will be um, plenty of time to uh, interweave some questions from the audience. So please audience, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A and I will um, glance over and try to, to pull them in. Um, you know, I have to ask Sean initially, what inspired you to write the book and to make this film? Okay, that's going to take you know, you remember you're asking a professor a question. So, you know, <laughs> 10 minutes from now, maybe we'll get to it. Um, it, it started quite honestly with a trip to the Serengeti and the uh, admission. So, I'm an indoor biologist. So, the other two panelists here are the real deal that, you know, really work in the real world. I'm an indoor biologist and I went to the Serengeti and, like everybody, nothing, nothing I'd ever seen, nothing I'd ever read, spoiled. The, you know, I was gobsmacked. I was just absolutely mm -hmm. stunned. And, but I also realized I didn't have a clue what I was looking at. And um, I thought, well, Jesus, it looks like a really compl complicated place. What do we, what do we know about how this works? So it was actually reading after I'd been to the Serengeti and I started to get into some literature. I thought, why as a working biologist, didn't I know all this? And as I started to reach out to some of the principals who I was reading, I, I got an idea, a sense that even you know, even some of their closer colleagues didn't, weren't necessarily, um, you know, yet all, all on the sort of same page with some of the, some of that, where that work was. And I thought, wow, this seems so important, but it seems to have kind of flown under the radar. And so that interested me as a writer to sort of chronicle this. And then the other sort of part of this that bookended the, the writing of the book was I went to a place called Gorongosa yeah. in Mozambique and was so inspired by what I saw there, an incredible effort to bring back uh, not only a wilderness, but also a society that had been crushed by civil war in Mozambique. And um, it, was, it was those two experiences that inspired me to write. <clears throat> now, how do you make, why make a film? Well, these, this was pretty cinematic material. And these stories of these people who went out into the wilderness for decades and um, discovered things that surprised them seemed like good material for, for the beginning of a film. So, um, that's a long story for the rest of the making of the film, but let's say there was a book, the book might've triggered the film. And fortunately the scientists were game to participate in the film and away we went. Well, it was very interesting to get that kind of historical, um, context of the roots of some of these, you know, kind of breakthrough discoveries, at least, uh, in the scientific world and, and from different perspectives of different scientists, um, trying out experiments to prove out concepts. Um, I, and I'd, I'd like to turn to Kehoe because you've been working a lot with corals and I'm wondering how these kinds of scientific discoveries and, and kind of the, the, um, the taking one discovery and pr proving it over and over again, you know, how does that inspire and inform the work you do with coral restoration? 
Yeah, well, thank you, Maggie, for inviting me to be part of this <clears throat> panel, uh, number one. Um, you know, the, the, the work that was highlighted in this film really uh, resonated with me because that was really important to the work that I did as a graduate student initially, uh, trying to figure out whether or not there were other rules of ecology, other rules of Serengeti that, uh, that I could uncover and even figure out how they played out in the world of coral reefs, uh, which was the, the main focus of my work. And so um, it really shaped how I thought about the kinds of questions that I could ask about how the world worked and using experiments, which is really important part of um, the film, actually experimenting, throwing the sea star back into the ocean, changing the density of sea urchins and things like that. Ability to do those kinds of experiments was really sort of eye-opening and opened up lots of venues for asking very specific questions about how the world around us worked. And so really shaped the way I approached my dissertation work. And I continue to do that because it, in fact, it is the gold standard, that experimental approach where you vary one factor and keep others under control and to see how that specific uh, experiment sort of pans out and, and what generalizations could be drawn from them. And so it is still the, the way I think about the world around me scientifically and, and, and uh, it shapes the kinds of questions that I ask as well. Yeah, that's, that's great. And I, I'm, I'm going to come to you, Fred, because I have a similar question for you. And that is you focused very specifically on a watershed, on the Patux, Patuxent uh, watershed. And, and what is it in, in this kind of scientific observation and discovery and, and um, focus that informs the work you do, that inspires the work you've done with the Patuxent? Well, a lot of my work on the Patuxent, well, a lot of the work of Patuxent Riverkeeper is clearly about protecting systems. We do actually view the Patuxent River as part of a broader system. And we see people as playing a role in that system. And we believe ideologically that people are subordinate in some ways to those overall natural systems that we've have to follow the rules of nature. At the point that we depart from that, we generally have um, problems, pollution problems, collapse problems, other kinds of problems. You know, we're a tributary that drains through the Chesapeake Bay, a movement that's been going on for 40 years to protect that bay. And we know, interestingly enough, that on the Patuxent, it's the only river in the Chesapeake Bay that has ever actually been substantially cleaned up, only to have those gains lost again over time. And the way that it actually got cleaned up was we actually stopped interfering with those systems. We had a political administration back in the 70s that actually stopped polluting the river. And it came back pretty quick. So the irony I'm pointing out is it doesn't take 40 years to clean up a system sometimes like this. It actually happens very, very quickly if you stop messing it up. And yet it's a lesson that we have to go and get authenticated through a science frame because this is knowledge that is very apparent to most people with an indigenous background. This is knowledge that's been out there to see and discern for a long time. So I think this is fascinating and interesting and exciting that we've got this convergence, right, of indigenous knowledge and natural observation and science. Yes, so mm -hmm. that's yeah. my- And I, I think that's a really, um, you know, the idea that it's multi-layered perspectives and, and what can we bring to f more fully understand kind of that holistic approach of our environment and, and connect with our environment. And, and, um, and what, you know, how do we communicate that and engage audiences, engage the public in understanding um, in a way that, that connects with them personally. And so here we have the Serengeti rules, which is big, grand, has all these different, um, you know, kind of deeply rooted scientific discoveries in different places. And then corals, maybe that gets a little closer to home. And then the Patuxent River gets really close to home for some people. And I think making that connection, understanding how we make that localized connection is so key. So I'd love to hear from all of you, maybe just circle back around Sean and, and Kehoe and Fred, you know, how, how, how is that localized connection made? How do we get um, the public to, to care more about their environment? Well, I think there's a, there's a pretty um, interesting scene, well, to me, an interesting scene in the film. John Turbor grew up in Virginia and he comes back to essentially Virginia in the film and walks through what, you know, most of us regular suburban citizens would say is a forest and really shows you through his eyes, the things just aren't right. And um, I think that's the connection. In other words, we, we may see a, something that looks green and, you know, to our eye, oh, look at that. Isn't that, mm -hmm. that, isn't that pleasant? Sure beats concrete, but it's not a healthy, productive 
system and you need at least, you know, you need some fresh eyes to, to look at that. So I, I, that was a deliberate inclusion in the film, which is we were a little afraid that these places were far away. They were, they didn't feel very proximate. I, I joked when I wrote the book because one of the stories I tell in the book, actually two of the stories I tell in the book involve by a fluke, Lake Mendota, which is in Madison, Wisconsin, where I took my first faculty position and had no idea that a long, long range experiment was going on there when I arrived. And Lake Erie, which I grew up on in, in Toledo, Ohio. And um, you know, I, I could have named this book, The Lake Erie Rules, but I, I think my publisher would have been disappointed. Um, <laughs> So, you know, the idea that, that these things are essentially in our backyard, the rivers, the ponds, the forests, et cetera, we had to bring that back home essentially in the film and, and John Turborg, I, I hope did that. That's great. How about you, Kehoe? Ago. I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead, Fred. No, a bunch of years ago, I wrote an article about the Danube because I wanted to, the Danube River in, 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 in Europe, because I thought here's a really tiny river that I work on, 110 miles, seven counties, all in one state. Here's a great big river. What kind of lessons could we learn? I wrote this article and I got nothing but just, just uh, vitriol from our members. What the heck has the Danube got to do with the Patuxent? I think the message is the rules are pretty much, if not the same, pretty similar. They're both systems you know, that operate in a particular way. And so that was a message that was really lost. I was, I was, it was a long time be, before I wrote another article about something other than the Patuxent. Oh, okay. <laughs> but the point is, these rules apply throughout. They apply here and there. These are nature's rules. We're all under, under, under that umbrella. And yet I think people's sense of place um, gave them a different idea that they're Danube rules and Patuxent rules. I don't think it quite works that way, so. But the connections are so important, absolutely. Yeah, and, you know, I'd like to follow up on that, Fred, because I think it does matter to have that physical connection to the environment. Uh, coral reefs, we have some coral reefs in the Florida Keys, but they're mostly gone. And so connection for many of us in the U.S. to coral reefs is pretty tenuous. And although it looks wonderful in a film, in IMAX, it is something that is exotic and not of our world that we understand immediately. And so not, not only do we have to tell the stories of these places, but we also have to make those connections that really you know, enliven our understanding of the world and why it's important. And that's hard, right? We can show lots of videos of these exotic and magnificent places around the world, but making that uh, uh, connection at the heart and mind is, is, a, is a huge challenge, I think. It's been interesting and during this time of COVID and I had a lot of students say, oh my gosh, what do we do now? We can't go anywhere. And I said, turn to your own backyard, look mm -hmm. in your own backyard, do some time-lapse, do some macro work. There is such beauty just in our own backyards. It may not be exotic or, you know, someplace mm -hmm. with big, big animals, but, but there's lots of little creepy crawlers. And, you know, so this may seem like a soft question, but I really um, am so curious personally, what was your first memory of connecting with nature in that way that just made you, you know, feel that sense of wonder that we feel when we watch a film like Serengeti Rules, like the Serengeti Rules. Well, my father took the family to Africa when we were kids and I lived in Sierra Leone and I lived in Tanzania. And there my father decided that I should learn the lab of life. So I didn't go to school during the years we lived in Africa. I just went out into the world. And among the experiences I had was swimming in a sea storm in the Indian Ocean. I don't think my parents knew about that. I haven't told them to this day, actually. <laughs> and that was a very humbling lesson. You know, nature kicked my ass, to be honest with you. <laughs> I mean, but each transaction I had with those waves, with that stormy surf, taught me something new about this personal connection I had to this resource. I took it very personally when it slammed me on the beach and skinned my knees and tore up my elbows and all that stuff. I thought that was very, very personal. You know, I'm sure it's all in my head. <laughs> I was there. I was incidental and probably could have, you know, could have lost my life. But it, it, it did kind of get me on this train of experiencing life and observing life firsthand. And that, that's an important and very empowering kind of idea you know and it's taken me into you know climbing and walking on the Appalachian Trail and all kinds of experiences throughout my life to see for myself I think that's really really the ethic there that's experiential okay yeah. Sean you must have been creepy crawlers <laughs> yeah I would like creepy crawlers but like I mentioned growing up in Toledo and, and I gotta say you know my backyard was was pigeons and squirrels and that was it so if you just get outside of town and get into the woods and then I discovered, you know, snakes and frogs and salamanders and stuff like that. And that visceral thrill of, you know, of discovery, you don't know what you're going to find under a log, just encountering that creature. 
I'm happy to report that 50 years later, that's still intact. Anywhere in the world, I still get that thrill. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and sometimes you get that thrill in the lab, you know, that same sort of, same sort of visceral thrill, but I still get it in nature and, and crave it and seek it anytime I can. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's visceral, absolutely. Kehoe, how did you connect with corals? So, you know, I, I've been thinking about this and it's, it's very different in that I grew up in cities all my life, uh, Seoul, Korea, and then Toronto. And it was, it was really looking at the world through the television. Uh, a television and it shows somebody called the Great Equalizer because it gave you access to the same thing that everybody else had. And I remember watching film by Jacques Cousteau and thinking, wow, that is really, really cool. And for whatever reason, it just simply resonated with me. And that, that thread just maintained itself through the things I did as an undergraduate and then all through graduate school. And so, you know, as I say that sometimes it's difficult to make that connection between uh, what's on the TV screen to what people actually feel, but sometimes it happens. And, and that unpredictability, I think is, is both uh, wonderful and, and difficult to sort of manage. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad you connected because you've done great work, you know. I think about, um, I had parents that took us backpacking and hiking and both educators and tide pooling. So the tide pool scene, you know, seeing my first octopus and, and all the creepy crawlies from banana slugs to <laughs> millipedes, you know. I mean, they were just always fascinating to me. But I also remember at about age nine or 10, um, the first, uh, in my lifetime, the first big oil spill in the San Francisco Bay um, and it was Chevron and it just went everywhere. And my, my parents were very committed. So they took us out of school to go over and help in this warehouse to clean the oil gunk off of birds, particularly pelicans in those days that were endangered. And I was too small to get near the birds. So I carried pails of water back and forth, you know, but I, I, it was my first realization of how tenuous our relationship is with nature and, and, that we could do great destruction. And, um, and now we hear a lot about gloom and doom and, and that you know, we've just blown it in this world. So I, I just would like to hear your reactions to that and, and what can you share with people to help us not feel like, oh, it's all over, you know, we, we've done it. Well, I'll, I'll jump in there on that one. Look, I think that's really why, why we made this movie. Uh, honestly, that journey I told you about in the book was, uh, you know, I had no exposure to ecology you know, as a, as a professional biologist, we're generally housed in different buildings, you know, molecular biologists and ecologists, and we don't know each other, we don't publish in each other's journals, we don't know the big discoveries. And I just, you know, I, I was seeing what everybody else was seeing. And I, I just wanted to kind of go out in the world for myself and talk to a bunch of ecologists and say, you know, how, how do you size things up? You know, are we, is it, it, you know, are we doomed? Or is there time to change the road we're, you know, the, the road we're on? And, um, especially when I went to Gorongosa, which was left for dead, say by the year 2000, um, I'm really dead. I mean, a deep, deep tragedy. Um, by the time I got there in 2015, I mean, it became a shining example of rebound and resilience. And that was for the people of Gorongosa as well. And so, um, and, and that time frame also sort of startled me. Uh, Fred, Fred alluded to this, that you know, the time scale we're talking about, if we said, oh, gee, if we just behave better now in a century, things will be better. Mm -hmm. That's kind of hard to motivate people. But if in a decade, you're actually going to see the difference, that's really different. And I think that's an important message we need to keep getting out there that nature is so resilient that rebound can be, um, you know, quite remarkable. You know, before the pandemic, my life was really, really hectic and had a lot of travel and that sort of thing. Now, during the pandemic, it's been some months for me cooped up. I'm really as busy as ever, but I'm in four walls. I get outside for walks and all that sort of stuff. So I've started slowing my attention span down a bit. I've had to. And I've seen all these epic things going on around me in nature and like morning walks. So I found a bird's nest in the hedge in front of my house. And I was so fascinated watching these little wren eggs start to kind of move towards hatching. And every morning I'd come out and check on the wren's eggs to see how this movie was going. I started taking pictures of the eggs because I wanted to see how this soap opera came out. One day I walked out there and the eggs were gone. There was a big black snake in there looking at me like, dude, what do you want? I'm like, what's up? And I'm thinking, you know, I've had a moment of like, maybe I can still save them. But the point is that the, you know, the pageant of life had really kind of swept 
passed me. And I was very incidental to that. And I was, again, I took that very personally. Oh, he took my eggs. I had great expectations with him, but it was also the movie of life, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's something that didn't stop. It kept rolling independent of my attention span, my own plans. And, and that was a comeuppance in, in, in a way. It's like, I can observe these things, but I can't control fate. I can't control these things. It's been a real intuitive kind of reckoning for me, just the business of slowing my attention span down enough to watch the rhythms going on around me. And it's been very healing in some ways, but also <laughs> it's had some, had some cliffhangers and some twists. And <laughs> Those well. natural history moments, <laughs> they, they get real. Bummer. <laughs> But Maggie, I think we also need to be, um, I guess, realistic about what how resilient our ecosystems are, and they are indeed. And and it doesn't take very much for that rebound to happen. And and for many ecologists, the questions are really to what state are they rebounding to? Yeah. Right. If you think about you know sixty thousand years ago, the plains uh, were filled with humongous herbivores, bigger than those herbivores in in places like Tanzania. And so what are we talking about when we talk about resilience and what, what, what ecosystem we want them to be resort to? And so we have to be realistic. These ecosystems will go on with or without us. Um, and really the question is where, we, where do we want it to get to so that it is still providing the resources that we depend on uh, and also provide some of the aesthetic and the spiritual values they also provide. And are there any answers? I mean, I, I can, in our Q&A here, we have several questions um, about, you know, are we looking at something because of climate change and, and human impact that has downgraded our planet overall? Do we have to set different expectations? Um, that's one question. Uh, there's another one about, you know, is there really hope with regard to sustaining the environment? Um, you know, can we really um, hold on to that, or do we really have to change our 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 mindset, or radically change our way of living? I mean, that's this is resilience and hope here, the theme for the night. So I'll I'll drill down on this one a little bit more. But yeah, isn't Fred. It amazing that we can find lessons in a developing nation as a technologically quote technologically advanced society. We can find answers, clues, resolution for some things that we're trying to figure out in places that are unbuilt you know, unconnected to our um, plastic, <laughs> you know, steel-based world. I mean, wow, that, that to me is kind of an interesting lesson too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Sean? Well, I think Keo is, 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 is onto this too, that we say rebound, we say resilient, what, what condition will they be? I, I keep mentioning the place Gorongosa because this is at least a, an ongoing story that we're, I'm following very closely with um, folks at, at HHMI. And um, no, it's not like it was 40 years ago. It's also a lot better than it was 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So it's an, it's an, whatever that new equilibrium or new flux that it's going to be in, um, it, you know, it's, it's going to be different. It's absolutely going to be different because what happened is it was so, the, the losses were so massive, but they were uneven. You got down to very small numbers, but uh, uneven among various herbivores and, and carnivores. And so when the chance to rebound happened, well, they're all kind of starting from a different baseline than where they were before. And so you have massive numbers of some things that used to not be in large numbers, and you have small numbers of some things that were in large numbers. And those managing the Gorongosa project are kind of figuring out, well, you know, what do we do here? We, we don't want to let this thing run to a situation where it might collapse. Um, but at the same time, there's going to be sort of a new configuration, uh, undoubtedly. Um, so... Yeah, I think I think the these these are not going to be if if they've been severely downgraded, are they really going to be like they were 100 years ago or 200 years ago? Yeah. Often not. But will they be productive? Will they be somewhat stable? Will they be somewhat resilient to environmental change to a certain degree? Um, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, part of the reason why these ecosystems are so resilient is because nature has built in lots of redundancies. And so if you take one species out, some of the functions and the roles that they play are then taken over by other species. And so for, for many ecosystems now, it's the question of uh, how many things can we pull out before the whole system collapses? And, and conversely, uh, how do we prioritize protection of species and particular habitats so that the critical pieces like those keystone species don't disappear? Right? And so, um, you know, getting back to the film, having a good understanding of how the world works 
will give us better ways to fix or upgrade or reduce the downgrade of these really important ecosystems. Yeah, really excellent point. And I'm just gonna remind people in the audience, please send in your questions to the Q&A. Um, and if you can make them short questions, so I don't have to say, excuse me, everybody, I have to read these questions over here. Um, I'd appreciate that too. So please send them on in. Um, one of the uh, things that we have seen in a lot of different places are, are um, the return of certain species. Um, but uh, I have to point out that Argo and Gosa, HHMI's another film, excellent film by Tangle Bank Studios, um, also looks very much at the relationship um, between the communities that are alongside Gorongosa and how to work together with the species and, and making the ecosystem healthier um, for, the, for the wild species as well as the human species, right? How, how to actually look at that holistically. And, um, and I'd love to hear from each of you about you know, your thoughts on, on ways to do that, on ways that um, our viewers can, can take steps toward that, toward a, a, a more holistic uh, look at how we can um, restore our ecosystems. To me, the non-scientist here, in all of this raises ethical questions. Knowing what we know, how much are we able to, how much should we be interfering with these natural systems? I don't know that that's a prerogative that we, as humans, who are also subject to these same systems, a part of these same systems, should, um, I think we should take to heart. And I don't know that I feel qualified to, to lay out what those ethical rules are, but I believe that's the natural next question to ask. Where do we fit into this? And how much should we be interfering with these natural rhythms, these natural systems? And I don't know the answer, but I think it's a provocative question for conservationists or regular folks. You know, we're a part of this. We have a role to play. We're subject to it. And we have to obviously behave accordingly. These systems also belong to themselves, I think, morally. I don't think we own them necessarily. So that's just my take on it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm sympathetic to that view, Fred. I, I think that probably some of the mindset I would say just of people I've met, um, you know, is we broke it. Obligation to fix it. Yeah. <laughs> so when, when the damage is pretty extensive, um, you know, can, can we do something? But there's a lot of tricky issues out there. Uh, another story that I'm you know, somewhat familiar with has to do with wildlife corridors in place like uh, the American West um, that you know, as we've developed and settled places and built highways and all sorts of things, you know, we did all this without any mind to, you know, migration patterns and, and things like, it, it, no, not only, not only mind, no knowledge of, we had no idea how far animals would roam. And, you know, we, we put boundaries around, called them national parks and said, look at this, isn't this pristine? Well, you know, the animals don't know how to read those signs. They, they go where they want to go. But if you things like, like the um, Yukon to Yellowstone corridor, uh, you know, there's a lot of work being done trying to essentially build connectivity now between spaces so that animals can, can, can move across those lands. A lot of those lands are tribal lands in the American West and Canadian West. And that's a collaboration that absolutely must involve, you know, people whose, you know, primary interests are, are, on, are in those lands. And I think there's some good models. I mean, some very positive stories of true cooperation, true collaboration between you know, ecologists and um, uh, tribal leaders and and tribal scientists um, to do this sort of thing. So there there are good there are some models out there to look to of how to both involve people and how to deal with the fact that you know we've chopped up the world in a ways you know we we chopped it up before we really figured out how it was connected, and and now we're kind of stuck with a really weird you know piece of Swiss cheese and we don't know what to do with the holes you know. Sounds like an excellent next film. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, it's a difficult question for, for me, um, but I, I look to the, the, the moral and the ethical perspective, I think, because there are parts of the world where people are so intimately tied to their environment for day-to-day -day lives that it is hard for somebody like me to say, let's break that and do something different. Uh, when, it, when we're asking them to really fundamentally change their livelihood and lives all told, then I don't know how we can do that. Um, and, and so it's something that I've been grappling with. I'm not sure what the answers are, um, but I, I, it's, 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 a, it's a Gordian knot. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, you know, it's been interesting in the filmmaking world to see um, the rise of what some are calling participatory filmmaking. And I think it's, um, there's an, probably an equivalent among scientists, that participatory science, where it does take multiple perspectives from people right, you know, boots on the ground there at the front lines of wherever the, um, the primary issues happening and having that conversation rather than coming in from the outside with outside solutions and, um, and making it you know, a much more collaborative journey to figure out the solutions. Um, and, and that leads me to another question, which is um, what is, are, are there signs of kind of next big innovative discoveries um, like the Keystone species discovery? What's waiting out there? Better go to a professional. Keo? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I think it's, it's more about um, being better at predicting complex systems or better understanding complex systems like big ecosystems, all those cascading effects that we never knew about. And I think part of that will, will, will um, be easier to do as we are able to collect more and more data. Um, and by that, I don't mean drones and satellites, which we do wonderfully and all these things that we put out to measure everything and anything. But I'm talking about, I think, the kinds of the things that we're doing with um, citizen scientists, the indigenous knowledge, the, the local knowledge, and bringing all that information together uh, to make more robust predictions or more deeply understand how our ecosystems work and what it's going to look like in the future under climate change, under increasing human stress and things like that. And so I think that's where the big things will happen as we are able to not only collect but process more information. Mm. Right, that's fascinating. Any one of, things that really, one of the things that interested me in particular about participating in this is that as a boy living in Dar es Salaam, I was a science nerd and very engaged in the work of Michael Grisnick. And I remembered a film that I saw that really had a huge influence on me called Serengeti Will Not Die. Yeah. And I subsequently visited Serengeti and camped in it, visited Lake Manyara and Gorongor Crater. I mean, these were my stomping grounds when I was growing up. And I feel as though this was foundational work that is beginning to take form in a very different way here 40, 50 years later, right? These are probably not familiar names, Leakey and Grisnick to anyone other than people who are anthropologists or scientific researchers, but these guys were out there on a limb doing some extraordinary work with, with limited resources, laying the groundwork for why these keystone species and others were especially important and needy of preservation. Um, and so that was to me kind of a, a closure, a circle in a way like, yeah, I, I get this. I know what these, you know, I've, been, I've seen some of these places and I know that I've seen some of these species. It was an amazing opportunity to grow up in a very unusual, unusual setting, so. That just wanted sounds, to share that these these are sounds wonderful. Carol knows who I'm talking about. These are guys who are out there really, really doing uh, it. <laughs> I, I, I hope you get a chance to meet Tony Sinclair because uh, the, the the actually the Serengeti uh, will never die film is there, there are clips in the movie from that because that's the first official count on the Serengeti and Tony joined in 1965 and the first thing they did is put him up in a spotter plane to count animals mm -hmm. and that's when they discovered. Strangely enough, the number of large animals was increasing rapidly in the Serengeti and people are like, what is going on? And, you know, not gonna spoil any fun in the film, but um, so that was that was Tony's grounding. And so I think Fred, you and Tony would have a lot of people, you know, in common, a lot of stories to tell. And Tony, uh, you know, spent 50 plus years on the Serengeti, um, you know, doing his work. So, uh, you know, a lot of, lot of pioneering stuff because when they arrived, there's actually a clip you hear in the trailer, him saying, you know, we knew basically nothing. And, you know, between the two world wars and other things, you know, it did not have been well studied. And you get into the 1950s and some of the first people that go there are, are biologists and they, you know, what do they do? They, they start counting things. And they're like, wow, there's really a lot of stuff here. <laughs> and, uh, and that, and from there on, it became, you know, sort of one of the biggest laboratories in the world. Yeah. By the way, there's a family joke about we call Juma. Juma was a character at one of the Lake Manyara lodges who had a terrible job. I think he was probably paying this poor guy pennies per day. But his job was to take a wheelbarrow of salt out into the bush in order to lure the elephants close enough to the lodge so that the British tourists and others wouldn't have to leave their gin and tonics to actually go out and look for the wildlife <laughs> to take pictures. And this is really difficult, crappy work. Nobody wants this job, right? There's a Sikh standing on the veranda pointing at this guy like, closer, get the elephants closer. This guy's like, you know, they're not paying me enough to get stomped on by an elephant. 
So anytime to this day in the family culture, in my immediate family, we see somebody with the world's worst darn job, someone will turn to me and say, oh, that's Juma. (laughs) Wow. No health insurance, no no nothing. That's right. That's right. But so um, a few more questions are lining up here. One is, uh, is ecotourism the answer to provide economic incentive to change? I'll throw out there sometimes. Um, it, you know, it, it does really uh, seem to help some places make the case for them for, for being preserved, at least to the degree that they are. Uh, in other cases, there may be other, other ways to be self-supporting. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't know the other views here on, on ecotourism. I think, you know, generally on balance, it's, it's been a financial lifeline for lots of places. As long yeah. as somebody's not getting sent out there to salt, salt <laughs> and lure salt the salt elephants. elephants. Yeah. <laughs> My understanding is that ecotourism works if the benefits of ecotourism is very local and not uh, taken by uh, bureaucracy somewhere else. And so mm-hmm. whatever resources are brought into a community by tourism has to remain largely within that community, otherwise the incentive to keep ecosystems and habitats intact disappear. Mm -hmm. And it plays out interestingly, you know, on different continents, certainly in places like Tanzania, you know, it's, it's huge source of, of national income comes from tourism. Um, But, you know, in Yellowstone, you know, wolf watchers, you know, the wolves, the argument you can make is uh, wolves are worth more alive than dead um, Mm -hmm. for wolf watchers. And the same with whale watching, you know, uh, on the oceans that, that there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of people interested in seeing wildlife. And uh, if, if it, you know, there, there may be, uh, there, I'm sure there are arguments against this, but nonetheless, from a pragmatic point of view, it may pay a lot of necessary bills and it may protect um, populations that deserve protection. Yeah. So maybe one answer among hopefully a whole lot of solutions to, um, to helping out. Here's another one. Um, as educators, how do you meet the challenge of informing students on the nature of the whole of our ecosystem rather than a specific scientific area? I think you got at this a little bit before about you know how stovepiped um, scientific areas can be, but how do you actually get um, people to understand the idea of an ecosystem, the idea of, of a more holistic picture? Kia, that's for you. (laughs) (laughs) In practical terms, uh, the way to jump into those kinds of uh, issues is to figure out what is a pressing problem. And then you sort of take that apart and you take it apart and you see underneath it, this network of species interacting with one another that is being perturbed by either pollution or climate change. And so that's how you, I think, approach these sorts of uh, questions. What is the problem that is pressing? Uh, and then start looking at the underlying biological diversity and how they interact with the environments around them and where those perturbations come in to mess things up. And conversely, that's how you fix it, by figuring out where those perturbations happen. Mm -hmm. So that's one approach. I remember a long time ago working on an anthropological film um, in Panama and the lead scientists had brought together um, scientists from 20, 21 scientists from all different disciplines in order to look at not just, oh, the gold, you know, which was, um, you know, any archaeologist was, you know, very focused on the gold or whatever value could be found, but every single, single, you know, aspect of the tomb that they were analyzing and, and you know, what, 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 what did people eat back then? What, you know, what uh, were their clothes made from? I mean, it really created a whole picture of the lifestyle, not just the, the, you know, the, the sparkle or gems or gold, um, you know, it really created and connected us to the life of those people at that time. And I think, you know, I think about that in terms of ecosystems as well. You know, if we can manage to touch on the different sciences and bring them together, we understand and connect at a much deeper level than just a singular slice. Um, so, and I think, and I think the, you know, the hook for, I'll say students, but I think for anybody, including grownups like me, you know, are these hidden connections. I mean, if you say, you know, trees need wolves, what? You know, beavers need wolves. They wouldn't seem like that would be a very, you know, comfortable 
arrangement. But um, as we as we understand these hidden connections, you understand that these things have um, all sorts of domino effects through these systems. And I think those little um, revelations as as hooks, I think, you know, make you sort of unpack the system layer by layer. And and I think from a teaching point of view, um, that works. Yeah. You know, rather than sort of throwing it all at once. Let's let's right. let's pull the thread and let's see what what's all connected here. And whoa, what that's all surprising. And I think that that makes students, I think, want to go on that journey and kind of rediscover some things that these people, for example, discovered that you know shocked them and shocked their colleagues. The, the power of curiosity. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think about just The Soul of the Octopus, which was a book that came out about three years ago, two and a half years ago. And then two amazing films came out this year. Um, and it's so fascinating to get those little facts of, you know, just feeling back and that curiosity and, and just draws you right in. And um, absolutely. And there's so much more to find out about our worlds around us. So uh, well, being you, able to educate through that is a great system. You know, Keo mentioned he was a city boy. I was a city boy growing up and, you know, and I was watching, so here's my, my story. I was watching Wild Kingdom with Marlon Perkins yeah, yeah. and Jim Fowler <laughs> in black and white. Black and white TV. Okay, that's it. What's that? No, no, you know, no Netflix, folks. You know, there are three channels, right? Mm -hmm. And that was enough to inspire me to want to see the rest of the world. And I sort of hope that you know, for for young scientists now, or aspiring scientists and students, that you know, there is a huge world to discover. Fred got to discover that world as a kid, even if the ocean kicked his ass. But um, <laughs> you know, there's a huge world to discover. It's still there, mm -hmm. and it, and it needs your help. I mean, people are needed to to do this work. So. Mm -hmm. Um, the opportunity to, to have an incredibly rich life is, is there for people who want it. I would say in the evolution of Patuxent River Keeper, a relatively young movement, you know, 2004 when we started, Waterkeeper movement's around, been around a little longer. But I would say that we treat science rather provisionally because we believe it's very useful as a tool for understanding certain things. We don't think you need a PhD to tell if water's undrinkable or bad, <laughs> it, you know, it's unacceptable, you know, for whatever reason. Scientists can tell you precisely why, but most people, can, their nose, their eyes, their senses will tell them what they need to know. We've wandered into an area with indigenous communities that we serve and um, people of color communities where the spiritual connection to these resources is just as important. So science, you know, we use expert witnesses in a lot of our litigation and I, we're one of the more, I say, litigious waterkeeper programs in the Chesapeake Bay. We sue people for breakfast, sue organizations, polluters for breakfast, literally. Um, and we sometimes win. Um, but I would say we're also deeply enmeshed in people getting spiritually connected to these resources and a lot of our ecotourism based work is really in kind of creating those types of opportunities for people to find their own place in the world in terms of how they fit into nature. I will say that through the eyes of a, you know, a legally trained guy, the first time I saw a Native American dropping fruit off the dock in our office as an offering to the river god, I was like, do you need a permit for that? <laughs> that, was my, that was my first reaction. And then I thought about, oh, you know, this is pretty, this is, you know, very biodegradable, very, you know. But I will say that it's a, it's a difficult way to dance because I do think that people get seized on the science as a way of defining these resources. And I, I, I'd like to think that that's not the 360 degree thing, right? That, that science is a part of it. But the rest of it, or much of the rest of it, I think, is also built within us. People save and fight to protect rivers that they really love and feel connected to. Not because there's some pretty good science to be found there necessarily, right? I mean, they're, they're different frames, they're different lenses. So we try to thread that needle very carefully. It's not easy, because people obviously come to these resources with their own baggage, with their own perspective. And it's not always identical. It wouldn't ever be. In fact, it wouldn't be interesting. People wouldn't be interesting if we were all <laughs> thought identically about them. So but we lure people in through different, you know, different paths. And I think that's the beauty of it. You know, it's um, and different things, you know, different lenses are going to um, appeal to different people. Um, I do need to ask a couple quickly. I know we're going to run out of time here, but my film students are very curious about the challenges of making this film. Um, the use of reenactments, the use of, you know, this, this big epic footage, um, personalizing while at the same time giving the, the bigger landscape. Um, do you want to just address just maybe two or three of the bigger challenges? Sure. Well, um, five main characters. That's, Maggie, you could probably vouch. That's a little tricky to do. So if, especially if you're going to get into their backstories, mm -hmm. um, how, do you, how can you kind of keep the movie moving forward if you're going to learn who all these people are and actually go to where they do their work and sort of see the seminal things that they've done? Um, so five characters is a lot. Um, but 
we thought it was real important how each sort of built on the other sort of Bob Payne was the anchor that got things going. And a lot of them, all, all of them had a connection to Bob. Um, so that, that gave you some, some of that, but that was tricky. There's a lot of debate about recreations cause they can just be very cheesy and um, you know, just not very convincing or compelling or whatever, but uh, this is to the credit of the creatives. Look, this is, you know, in, in a film to come together like this, it's the combination of, you know, we on the science advisor side are hoping to make things clear. It's, it's not like we're trying to make the science, you know, dense or we're not trying to push massive amount of information. We just want the science to be clear. What did they do? Why did they think this? What does it mean? At the same time, the, the creatives are trying to keep you engaged. And, but when I first saw the recreations, I, I saw, if you've seen the film, there's, for example, a segment that Mary Power tells her story of how she got started. And she's telling this story and imagine not, not filming it the way the, the filmmakers made it. So if you've seen the film, okay, or if you haven't, here we go. But Mary's telling the story of, of a kid, of, as a young kid, that she had very poor eyesight. She couldn't make out animals. She couldn't even make out really leaves in the tree. But when she was given a mask and snorkel and put her head underwater, the refraction of the water, things were clear to her. And so that became her habitat to this day. I mean, she toured with the film in all sorts of places and told the story. But the filmmakers brought that story alive visually. And just about, you know, if you want to know, at least it was a lesson for me, because, you know, I'm, I'm an executive producer. I'm not, I'm not the filmmaker. My kids can tell you what kind of films I make and nobody wants to see them. Um, <laughs> but if you take that 90 seconds or two minutes about what inspires somebody, what's that moment where they're like, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. If you can capture that lightning, you know, in the bottle, which I give, you know, 200% credit to the filmmakers for doing that from, for these characters, then maybe for the audience, they, they connect. They're like, yeah, these are just people. They're not, they're not people in white coats, you know, fully formed adults. They're, they're youngsters trying to figure out what they want to do in life. And they had these seminal moments, just as Fred and Keo were describing that, that lit them up. And they had to do this for the next 50 years. And they're still doing it. They're still doing it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that because that's so important. And, and um, on the conservation or environmental or activist side, any words of advice, Fred, Kehoe? There are several different questions in here. If you want to work and engage um, as a conservationist, as a, with the public and environment, um, uh, how do you do that? What, what career advice is there uh, from um, those aspiring toward public media and science environmental film? What would be your advice? Any of you? I've had to be resolute pretty much every day I've done this work on which days I'm making a living and which days I'm making a difference, to be honest. <laughs> They're not always the same thing. But I would encourage people to find their muse in nature and connect with whatever thing, place, resource, uh, part of nature that you particularly resonate with and pursue some personal compact with that, whether that's protecting it, honoring it, improving it, whatever. Whatever, I think that's that's kind of built in, hardwired. And I don't know that everyone knows that that's there. It lives, I think, within most of us, if not all of us. Yeah, yeah. And that's hugely important because I think those also create durable movements. I've learned pretty early on, I'm not gonna save the Patuxent River all by myself in one lifetime. So the only work that really is worth doing is the work where I plant durable seeds where the work will continue. And that really relies not so much on finding grants, but on finding and connecting with people who will as I think Sean pointed out, light them up, help yeah. people get lit up about this stuff. And they will fight like hell to save these resources. Even when the money's gone, <laughs> yeah. right? They will it's still the passion, it's the heart. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Theo. Yeah, you know, I think that's right. I think, um, uh, and you don't have to be a scientist or, um, you know, paid conservationist. I think we can, we can express our, our uh, wishes through the, all the things that we do every day in our lives, how we spend our money, what kinds of food we choose to buy, uh, what kind of work we do, whether or not we vote, what kinds of issues that we vote on, where do we where do travel, all those things that are things that we do every single day do have impact. And, and on the opposite side, I don't want people to get discouraged if they can't do all the things that they think are required of somebody who is committed to the environment. Make that commitment and do the best on all the things that you do and hopefully get to that place where you are comfortable with the decisions you are making. Mm. 
Yeah, that's great advice. As we walk through life, right? Just be really aware. Sean, any last pieces of advice here? Well, I'm looking at some of the questions that are in and I've tried, I've tried to answer some of them um, while we're here because I really appreciate people's interest. I, I think that, you know, maybe the, both to scientists, this is, this is so obvious to some people, but not so much in the scientific community, which is, you know, and Fred talked about this, you have to inspire love. This, you know, storytelling is an emotional experience. We seek out stories for the emotional payoff. Scientists, we live in the world of information and data and all this kind of stuff, but that, that dimension is necessary, but not sufficient. And, you know, filmmaking is what brings across those emotions. And people are asking about telling these people stories. And, you know, there's a style of filmmaking that is, you know, information, 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 but we absolutely went for the more emotional chords here because that's what inspires people. That's what gives them the commitment to kind of go through, you know, whatever they have to go through to pursue some particular goal. So to my fellow scientists and science students, um, you know, telling stories is really important. And the, the emotional dimension, as Fred described it, the spiritual dimension, which connects directly to the emotional axis, mm -hmm. this is really, really important. It's, it's uh, otherwise, we don't compete very well with other stories in the world. That's a, a great end note, but I thank you all. This has been just an exceptional discussion. I could carry it on. I, you know, I feel like um, these kinds of discussions are so important and I thank Films Across Borders and, um, and Matt and your team, thank you always for putting on a, a flawless technical miracle that you do every time. Um, but I, I really thank you all to our panelists. Thank you. And I encourage all of you who are watching, get off the Zoom, go outside, take a deep breath, look at that beautiful sky, really be in your, your element and, and recognize the beauty and the wonder around us because it's, it's precious and it's a gift. And I hope we all can go forward and enjoy it um, every day. Thank you.